In the name of God, the creator, redeemer, sustainer, I am bold to bring you this word today. Amen. God is in charge. Now, a statement like that should not surprise you coming from the pulpit of a Presbyterian church on a Sunday morning in October. God is in charge. That is crystal clear to those of us who would follow Jesus, to those of us who read through Scripture, it is crystal clear through the prophets and the Psalms, God is in charge. Praise God for this. Wait on God for that. God will deliver. God will send. God will provide. And the hope of God's people throughout all of this is that we will somehow find favor with God and be blessed by God's providence. And all God's people say, Amen, so be it, so far, so good. But, but, when God's people imagine that they have found the secret to success, And when God's people claim that success as our right, when we dare to imagine that we hold the keys to the divine heart of God, that's when it all goes pear-shaped. History bears me out. Read your history, especially your church history. Joel, as a prophet, is not often read, but widely appreciated when he is. And in the reading from this morning, from the second chapter, Joel is helping God's people understand that there is a cycle of good times and hard times, a cycle that must be accepted. I will bring rain, and there will be abundance, says the Lord, to make up for all those times when there wasn't, when I sent the hopper and the destroyer. And your young men will have visions, and your old men will dream dreams, and I will pour out my spirit on everything. And, oh, also, there's going to be some disturbing signs in the sky and dark clouds, and the moon will turn to blood. It's discordant to say the least. But I think it's a sign that Joel is trying to offer the people to say, good with the bad, boys and girls. God is in charge. Our preference for constant comfort is not going to be honored just because we honor God. And Jesus' parable for the day helps to make that clear. Here stands the self-proclaimed righteous man, the Pharisee, the one whom every professional clergy person dreads to be associated with. There he stands and applauds the blessings that he enjoys, praying for all to hear, claiming them as his right. Thanks be to God, I'm not like those other folks. The other folks in the temple, by the way. Thanks God that I'm not like them, like this tax collector over here. I'm a good person. I'm doing good things. I'm saying the right things and I'm saying them out loud. Aren't you pleased, God? Won't you bless me, God? Please show that I'm one of the good guys. Would you do that, God? When faith sounds like that, when faith turns to self-congratulations, then faith has been undermined. And when you see that, 
When you hear it, if you don't cringe and run away, then you need to examine your faith. Because faith is always concerned with something beyond ourselves. Big, broad issues. Compassion, connection, humility in the face of grandeur is the mark of faith. Faith is not a contest. I didn't get my degree. I was not ordained because I won some prize. I don't wear this regalia to show that I'm better than anyone. I wear it to remind me that I'm not. Faith is not a contest, a race among the faithful to be exalted, to get to the top of the pile. Faith is a journey through the highs and lows of life. Faith is a constantly changing encounter with the work of God in, among, and sometimes against the desires of our own hearts. Faith. Faith is that guy over there, the tax collector, bowed in the shadows, wanting mercy, not magnificence. I came down to the church yesterday morning, don't tell anybody, because I'd forgotten to email pieces of my sermon home to myself and the edits weren't done. And I saw two things simultaneously outside on Fifth Ave. I saw a young deer mowing through the crab apples and the berries, hobbling her way around on the bricks. And I saw a man standing in the middle of the road, hollering that no one should look at him, that you aren't better than me shouting at the sky, at God, at the buildings, at the, the deer, for all I know. And I wondered if God had tried to show me a parable. Grandeur and magnificence are part of God's created order. The vast spread of the prairie landscape, the towering mountains, the the restless oceans, the diamond-studded night sky. A deer on Fifth Avenue, snow on yellow leaves, all of these things are hard to ignore. They point to something that's beyond our control. They ought to give us perspective. Even a quick glance at the majesty of our surroundings should help us realize that there are forces at work that we cannot manage. That there's something in the universe bigger than us. Now, as a species, we're pretty resourceful. We do a lot of good things. I don't want to diminish any of that. But sometimes you just got to look around and say, well, I I can't do that. It's a lesson that's laying there for all of us to take in. And history suggests that we don't easily accept that lesson. I mean, it's a big world and we've got much smaller problems to deal with and we'd like to get on with conquering those things. Thank you very much. So you can forget your broad vistas, Mr. Lackey, and you can forget your deep thinking, Mr. Lackey. We got life to live and we want to get on with it. Our day-to-day needs are enough to keep us occupied, and we want to succeed in those things. Right? Right? Well, I'm afraid that this morning's gospel won't let you get away with that. This morning's gospel invites us to make grandeur and magnificence personal, but not in the way you expect. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. 
As I said earlier, this is not your standard kingdom of God parable. This is a story against the kingdoms that we create for ourselves. And for all the efforts of the social justice warriors through the 60s and 70s, for all the efforts in recent years to find equity and justice for dozens of different groups, causes, or countries who have been perpetually marginalized, the truth is we'd rather have our kingdoms safely encircled. The truth is we'd rather have the red ribbon to wear and wave at the rest of the world. The truth is we're not very good at being good to one another. Especially if the other thinks, looks, acts, loves, votes, prays, or lives differently than we do. Now, I'm not breaking any ground here. You've heard me say things like this before and nodded or nodded off. That's fine. I'm reminding you that we have all seen for ourselves the way that the world dissolves into teams, each team seeking the red ribbon, over just about any issue under the sun. And to my perpetual despair, faith is often used as a measuring stick for these battles. And often, too often, It becomes a case of they who claim God loudest get to make the rules and win the day. And more and more I find I have a hard time imagining that God is honored by any of this. And Jesus' parable proves my point. I'm skimming the details here for obvious reasons. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole with you every Sunday morning. I offer my thoughts not to champion one side over the other, but as an invitation to all sides, and especially to those who choose to make faith a building block for their political platform or their social platform. If you're going to stand on that ground, then be careful. Be careful. Be full of care. Consider that instead of a call to arms, a phrase we've heard all too often recently, Instead of a call to arms to protect and ensure personal freedoms, that perhaps the next faithful step is to invite people to open armed compassion and concern for the well being of all. Consider, and I speak to myself, that a call to inclusion should include the like-minded and the contrary. Consider that your economic package, your social safety net, your national energy policy, your foreign policy, might be all well and good, but it is not the solution for every single problem in the world. Be careful. And consider that your intelligent collaboration within the global community might go a long way to ensuring peace, justice, and security for all, and not just some. And no, Jesus doesn't say any of this. I get it. But in Jesus' call for humility in the face of differences, in Jesus' call to honor God in a way that actually honors God, 
we are invited to live into a faith that displays humility in tangible ways. This is not a call to be humbly invisible, to stand in the shadows and not make waves and just live our best lives. Too many of the best of us are doing just that to no real effect. No, we are called to be actively humble. That is not a contradiction. We are called to be actively humble, to point out the inconsistencies of those who would loudly and publicly claim the faith in the service of their own self-aggrandizement, of their own self-righteousness. We are called by Jesus to notice the self-righteous and to question their self-assessment. We are called to honor the image of God that lives in every single human. No matter what we think of that person's address or accent or activist cause or political alignment. And I'm not going to lie to you. It is the most difficult thing that Jesus asks us to do. The most difficult task. Yes, as I said to the kids earlier, it's hard to win the first prize ribbon every week. It's harder to be humble about it. The most difficult task that Jesus gives to those who would follow him is to love one another. Full stop. No addendums. No yes buts. The God-honoring thing to do in a world obsessed with its own importance is to offer that love to one another in humble certainty. It is by this that they will know that we are followers of Jesus. It is our humility that lets us see where God is at work. Would you be a participant in that, I wonder? Amen.